Well, good evening, everybody. Um, we have folks from the East Coast and the West Coast. So good evening, good afternoon, whatever your time is. I'm Carl Johnson. I'm the director for the C.S. Lewis Institute here in Chicago. And on behalf of my colleagues from the C.S. Lewis Institute in Atlanta, we welcome you to uh, this newest edition of our webinar series where we uh, invite authors uh, and experts and speakers to talk about C.S. Lewis. And tonight we're going to be joined by uh, Terry Glaspie, who is the author of this book right here, Not a Tame Lion. I'm excited to uh, share this evening with Terry. Before, though, I'd like to just uh, share a few words about the C.S. Lewis Institute in case you're new to us. Uh, the C.S. Lewis Institute is a ministry that was founded in 1976 by two men. We like to call them the two Jims, Dr. Jim Houston and Jim Hiskey. Dr. Houston had been friends with Lewis and uh, has stated that the vision of the Institute was not to create more fans of Lewis, but to create more people like Lewis. Hence, our motto or our, our, our tagline, if you will, is discipleship of heart and mind. And our desire is to build people up in Christ, in their faith, just the way Lewis was. Lewis was a man who was sold out for his faith in every area of his life. So that's what we try to do. And this webinar is just one of the ways that we try to minister to folks like you uh, to build you up in Christ, to help cultivate the mind of Christ, and to live that out uh, with your hands and feet. Uh, we have a special opportunity right now, because this is the time of year when we're accepting applications for the C.S. Lewis Fellows Program. Uh, the C.S. Lewis Fellows Program is a tuition-free, one-year, serious discipleship program 
that basically runs from June to June in all of the cities in which we're present, which is we're at about 17 or 18 right now. I've lost count. Um, but if we're in a city near you, and I know we have people from Chicago, Atlanta, and Seattle particularly who've tuned in, uh, we're, we're in your city, and we'd love for you to consider the fellows program. Um, but don't take my word for it. We have a quick uh, video with some testimonials that we'd like to share with you uh, so you can hear straight from the mouth of people who've been in the program. Um, I learned how to love people. My life has completely 100% changed. Um, I thought I loved Christ and I did. But after the program, I learned how to love people through Christ. I think I'm most grateful for the relationships I've developed, uh, you know, with the people who were part of the program. Uh, we formed friendships that I think are there for life. So I think that I think is the thing I'm most grateful for. One of the values is uh, this is different than uh, Bible studies that we have all gone through, through our churches or through other um, organizations or uh, groups. This is a deep dive into so many areas that quite frankly, we on our own don't take time to think about. That's how my life changed. All of a sudden, Christianity and came back to me. It wasn't, because churches teach you what you can do for others, always what you can do for others, but they forget the condition of the, of the heart of the people that are sitting in those pews. And I was neglecting my heart. And this program literally taught me no more neglect. Now you have to really look at this heart and look at what God sees. Even though along the way, there were lots of times where I thought, Lord, why are you calling me to this assignment? Um, because this is too much. But then it turned out to be the best decision, one of the best decisions of my entire life. I've realized that I need to listen more and speak less, and uh, that's been a, a huge realization, and also to, to think more of other people. Try and realize, how can I serve the other person? That, I think, has been a big change. So it was really a community and a family that helped when it was really hard to stay the course. And I'd say that I got to the end of it kind of in shock. I, I can't believe I did this. I can't believe it. It was just, it was as great a feeling as when I graduated from college even. Real, I've, I've realized that I need to spend more time in both the Word and on my knees. So that has changed since the Fellows Program. I never did that uh, two years ago. I changed. I, I truly changed as a result of learning what I what I did for those two years in this program. You'll discover things about yourself that you never imagined that will increase your love for God, which will increase your love for every person you see and meet on how to live an abundant life rooted in love and overflowing love. So if that's your aspiration, the Fellows Program is definitely for you. Yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to do is build people up so you can love God and love others. And I say this not only as the director of the C.S. Lewis Institute, I tell, I say this to you as a fellow. The reason I'm doing what I'm, I'm doing now is because in my previous career in the marketplace, I participated in the C.S. Lewis Fellows Program, and it captured my heart so much that it reoriented my career, and I knew I wanted to go into ministry and help others experience this kind of discipleship. I remember I had an aha moment at that mo at that time and thought, why have we struggled so hard with this kind of discipleship? And I just resolved that nobody should have to, have, have to struggle with that again. So um, not everybody's going to change careers like I did, but we certainly welcome you on this journey. So uh, you can see the ticker below. It has the website. We'll put that up again a little bit later, but we would love for you to prayerfully consider the fellows program. Okay, well, without further ado, I would like to introduce here momentarily uh, Terry Glaspie. Terry is a writer and a teacher, a creative mentor, and someone who finds various forms of art, 
painting, films, novels, poetry, and music to be some of the places where he most deeply connects with God. And that resonates with us here at the C.S. Lewis Institute as well. Uh, Dr. Glasby teaches inkling studies, spiritual formation, and writing at Northwind Seminary, where he got his doctorate in spiritual formation. And he also has a master's degree in history from the University of Oregon. And I know he's probably saying, go ducks right now. Uh, Terry's written over a dozen books, including Discovering God Through the Arts, 75 Masterpieces Every Christian Should Know, Fascinating Stories Behind Great Art, Music, Literature, and Film. That book's been high on my list for a while. Uh, Not a Tame Lion, The Life, Teachings, and Legacy of C.S. Lewis, The Prayers of Jane Austen, 25 Keys to Life-Changing Prayer, Bible Basics for Everyone, and of course, others. I go on and list them all and take all night. Uh, He's been the recipient of several major national awards for his writing, including two Christianity Today book awards and awards from the Gospel Coalition and the Evangelical Christian Publishing Association. So without further ado, I would like to have Terry join us. And Terry, thanks for being with us tonight. We're so excited. This is a first time uh, chance to to partner with you. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here with you, Carl, and to get to share with everybody. Um, Lewis has meant so much to me and to be able to talk about him is always a pleasure. Great. Well, I'm going to pull myself out and we'll give you the floor and uh, we're excited to hear what you have to say. Okay, sounds good. Well, uh, it's good to be with everybody tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about C.S. Lewis's creative and intuitive apologetics. Uh, My subtitle really, I think, captures the flavor of the talk, which is how imagination and beauty provide a vision of God's reality. And so that's what that's the element of Lewis's apologetics that I'd really like to take a look at uh, this evening. So. Uh, Well, you know, because he wrote books like Mere Christianity and The Problem of Pain, Miracles, and God in the Dock, I think many people assume that that it was the kind of rational arguments, which you can find in these books, that were what led him to faith. That it was a careful consideration of these logical arguments that eventually forced him to embrace faith as the most reasonable option. But... I think while many of us appreciate this side of Lewis, how he put his intellect to the service of faith, this doesn't really tell the whole story. Because while logic and reason were important to him, perhaps even more crucial on his own journey to faith were the experiences that arose from beauty and imagination and the way that these opened a bigger vision for the world and hinted at what the ultimate meaning of the world might be. For Lewis, as as is the case for countless uh, converts, it was not so much a matter of being convinced that Christianity was true by a series of arguments, but of experiencing the beauty and the mystery of the world. And response to finding that only a grace-suffused Christian vision of reality was what could answer the deepest questions in his heart and in his mind. So in this talk, I'd like to highlight three approaches that Lewis took toward communicating the Christian message. Uh, The first one, which you see on the slide there, is uh, the rational. The second is the imaginative, and the third is the intuitional. Now, I'm going to put the greatest emphasis tonight on the second two, as we search for an understanding of how imagination, intuition, and beauty were key to Lewis's communication of what Christianity means in the lives of Christ followers. Uh, And I think they were also key to his own path to faith, and we're going to look at that. I I believe that the intertwining of these last two approaches offer a powerful model for effectively communicating the Christian faith, especially in our skeptical, cynical, postmodern world. But let's start with a brief look at the promise and the limitations of rational apologetics. Now, when using this approach, as I, as I put on the slide, the rational approach seeks to defend Christian belief by logical argumentation and intellectual persuasion. Now, when using this approach, Lewis marshals his amazing intelligence to defend Christianity and to argue against competing philosophies. A lot of us owe a lot to the kind of books that he wrote in which he did this. He saw this kind of approach as necessary in the face of modern criticism. 
as he writes in The Weight of Glory, which we can see on this next slide, to be ignorant and simple now, not to be able to meet the enemies on their own ground, would be to throw down our weapons and to betray our uneducated brethren who have under God no defense but us against the intellectual attacks of the heathen. Good philosophy must exist if for no other reason than because bad philosophy needs to be answered. Well, throughout his life, Lewis was not hesitant about using reasoned arguments for faith because he was convinced that Christianity was reasonable at its very core. He often tried to integrate reason and imagination in his approach. In fact, his earliest Christian book, The Pilgrim's Regress, actually has the subtitle, An Allegorical Apology for Christianity, Reason, and Romanticism. He was trying to put it all together. He wants to provide an alternative way of seeing, of thinking, of experiencing life, and of understanding the world. And in this and other books, Lewis wasn't so much setting out to prove that Christianity was true, but to show that it was reasonable and plausible. Even his most rational argumentation, though, interestingly, is always wedded, I think, to stories, metaphors, and word pictures. He tends to use both words and images when he wants to make his point, but he always understood the limitations of a purely rational and reasonable apologetic approach. And we can see this in his poem, The Apologist's Morning Prayer, where he writes, from all my lame defeats and oh much more, from all my victories that I seem to score, from the cleverness shot forth on thy behalf, at which while angels weep, the audience laugh, from all my proofs of thy divinity, thou who wouldst give no sign, deliver me. Lord of the narrow gate and the needle's eye, take from me my trumpery, lest I die. <laughs> I think this shows the attitude that he had of, of seeing the limitations of how far argumentation can go. As he wrote in a letter to Dorothy Sayers, apologetic work is so dangerous to one's faith. A doctrine never seems dimmer to me than when I have just successfully defended it. Somehow, when we approach faith as primarily a set of beliefs to which we must assent and therefore must depend upon the faculty of reason to defend it, I think we're in danger of reducing Christianity to a philosophy instead of embracing it as a living vision of reality that we're invited to participate in and become part of. There's an unquestioned value in an intellectual defense. But Lewis offers us so much more in his writings than just a series of arguments or rationalizations for belief. He invites us to experience the full reality of faith by means of our imagination and our intuition. Let's first consider the imaginative approach. In the imaginative approach, Lewis uses his gift of storytelling as a means of conveying spiritual realities and insights through fiction, myth, and allegory. During the course of Lewis's life, it was beauty and imagination that kept beckoning to him that there was something more to existent than what his intellect could fully comprehend or explain. Next slide. Lewis seemed to be working, I think, it, on two different and sometimes uh, completing, uh, or competing impulses at the same time. First, there's Lewis the philosopher, who wanted to argue rationally. And second, there's Lewis the poet, who understood the power of imagination, myth, story, image, and poetry. Now, Lewis's books of the 1930s and 40s, I think, are especially dominated by this tension between these two poles. And, and, and I don't mean the tension in a negative way. It's actually kind of an interesting positive ten, tension that creates the wonderful writing. Some books, such as Out of the Silent Planet, tend toward the pole of myth and imagination. And others, such as The Problem of Pain and Miracles, tend toward the pole of rational argumentation. Now, books like Screwtape Letters and The Great Divorce are, I think, a beautiful hybrid of these two ways of communicating. 
But by the 1950s, toward the end of his life, Lewis seems to be, have become less interested in penning intellectual arguments and tended to let the power of the story do much of the heavy lifting, especially in the Chronicles of Narnia until we have faces. Next slide. One of Lewis's most influential mentors in imagination was George MacDonald, the Victorian novelist and theologian whose fairy tales introduced readers to spiritual realities. His early fairy tale for adults, or fairy tale for grown-ups, as he called it, was Fantasties, a book which had a huge impact upon Lewis's journey toward faith, and which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Other wonderful spiritual fairy tales he wrote included At the Back of the North Wind, The Golden Key, The Princess and the Goblin, and The Princess and Cody. I hope that you've had a chance at some point to enjoy some of these. And if you haven't, um, I would really encourage you to e explore these wonderful fairy tales. What's interesting about them, though, is none of them really directly teach a Christian message. But what all of them do have are powerful images that point toward a spiritual realm, a, a realm other than our own. And they reveal something about how that other world, how that spiritual realm operates. Well, I think through his own fiction, Lewis sought to do something similar to what he had learned from his great master. The, the first fruits of it were his allegorical story, The Pilgrim's Regress. Now, The Pilgrim's Regress is modeled on, of course, on Bunyan's famous classic allegorical work, uh, the Pilgrim's Progress. And Pilgrim's Regress is both a veiled kind of autobiographical retelling of his own journey to faith and an argument against the philosophical trends of Lewis's day. His targets include in the book Sigmund Freud, ma philosophical materialism, and various secular versions of romanticism. Uh, but the approach in this first really fictional work of his uh, after becoming a Christian, is generally anything but subtle. In fact, just in case his readers might not fully comprehend what he was up to, when he put together the second edition of the book, he actually attached explanatory running heads, which deftly summarize what he was trying to say. One of them, for example, says, quote, why all accounts of the unconscious are misleading, unquote. Well, when you have to do that, it's perhaps a sign that you have failed to fully trust the story or the art of storytelling. Uh, of course, this being a work of Lewis, it still, I mean, contains so many unforgettable moments. And it's, it's a wonderful read. And it's especially notable for being the first book which introduces the argument for desire, from desire, which is something he would revisit throughout his writings. But I would say, too, though, that the story often gets weighed down by long philosophical discussions by the characters, and there's a lot more telling going on than showing. <clears throat> I think it succeeds more as a work of apologetics than it does as a, book, a work of fiction. That's not the case with the next works that he undertook, uh, which were his space trilogy, which were spaced out over a number of years. Uh, and with the space trilogy, Lewis relied on a more kind of mythic mode of communication. And hence, he was able to draw the reader into an experience rather than an argument. He offers a compelling kind of transcendent vision of reality. And though there's a fairly transparent message that Lewis does want to share in these books, it isn't delivered primarily by argumentation. Instead, the books invite the reader into a vicarious spiritual experience rather than attempting to argue them into submission to his way of seeing things. Therefore, these three novels are quite successful as literature, and they function more, more simply, actually, as an apologetic tool. Of course, an important element of what he was doing was he was juxtaposing in these books the modern philosophy of scientific materialism, which was so popular in his own time and which still has so much influence on our own, was something more ancient and enduring and life-affirming. And that is the Christian message. 
In these books, we experience the imagination as the gatekeeper to the human soul. It helps us get past all the defenses we erect to keep it away. And the books are also a great read. As Lewis knew, if you're going to introduce spiritual themes and you want people to seriously ponder them, you better make sure that your book is interesting and entertaining. And that he did, that he did so well, as he did with the Chronicles of Narnia. Now, in some ways, it's really surprising that C.S. Lewis would have even written children's books. For throughout his life, he really had kind of fairly minimal contact with children. But I think what Lewis did have was a childlike joy and a childlike curiosity about life, and especially a childlike belief in the wonder of God and God's created world. And for me, reading these books is actually a spiritual experience in itself. In Narnia, what we experience is theology as image rather than theology as proposition. The concept of faith is actually embodied in these stories. With the Chronicles of Narnia, Lewis once again treads the path of the mythic. But these books can be read on two levels, merely as entertaining and engaging children's stories or as fodder for contemplation on the meaning of the biblical story of Christ and of the practices and disciplines of Christian living. <clears throat> Next slide. L Lewis writes, in reality, he, Aslan, is an invention giving an imaginary answer to the question, what might Christ become like if there really were a world like Narnia and he chose to incarnate and die and rise again in that world as he actually has done in ours? And that's what he does so beautifully in this book. Here's, here's the way I have described these novels or these, these children's novels in my book, 75 Masterpieces, Every Christian Should Know. Um, I said, in Narnia, we're given glimpses of transcendence, of a story much bigger than first meets the eye. On initial examination, these seem simple children's stories, with talking animals, and witches, and young boys and girls discovering their inner strength and courage. But... In the midst of these stories, the reader becomes aware that something magical, something supernatural might just break through at any moment. One can feel the breath of the great lion rustling through the pages of the story of Lucy, Peter, and Edmund as it becomes, as their story becomes my story and your story. And I think the Chronicles of Narnia are a place where our longing for God can be awakened, where our wonder comes alive, and where we capture a, a numinous vision of God's glory. In a very real sense, I think, the Chronicles of Narnia are so effective in preparing readers for later hearing the gospel story. Next uh, is Till We Have Faces, which was Lewis's last major literary effort. And it has a complexity and sophistication in the way that it deals with the world of myth that really isn't found in any of its predecessors. Lewis's retelling of the Cupid and Psyche myth is a forum for exploring such weighty issues as suffering, human and divine love, the nature of God's self-revelation, and the transformation of the self. Quite unlike anything that preceded it, Lewis embeds any apologetic messages deep into the soil of the story itself, which leaves the reader with the joyous surprise of discovering these truths for themselves, rather than having them clearly pointed out. In one of his letters, Lewis talks about this important aspect of self-discovery in the best of mythic writing. He says, the same story may be mythical or symbolical to one person and allegorical to another. 
When I first read George MacDonald's stories as a boy, I was overwhelmed with a sense of significance, but I couldn't have identified any one thing in them with any idea, nor got the significance of the whole conceptually apart from the story. Now, when I reread them, they are almost purely allegory to me because in the interval, I have discovered what they are about by a quite different route. This, I think, is the power that can be found in very effective mythological and allegorical stories, stories of the imagination. I think we can think about it this way. In a sense, they create, they kind of plant a, a sort of time bomb of spiritual insight within us that only later explodes into full understanding long after the story has been read. Myth doesn't forcefully pound upon the front door demanding entrance. It tends instead to sneak through the back door and move us in ways that we weren't actually prepared for. In the kind of myth that Lewis fashioned, God often appears incognito in the mythology. The mythology offers the taste, the taste of truth, rather than just asking for cognizant assent. This is what Lewis refers to in one place as the imaginative embrace. As uh, William Gray in his book on fantasy literature says, sometimes what an author seeks to communicate may be too subtle, too elusive, too close to be caught in rational concepts. Or as Lewis explains in his essay, Myth Become Fact, myth, he says, is the isthmus that connects the peninsular world of thought with that vast continent that we really belong to. It is not like direct experience bound to the particular. In theological terms, the incarnation is, as he writes, God's myth, where the others are men's myths, i.e. the pagan stories are God expressing himself through the minds of the poets using such images as he found there, while Christianity is God expressing himself through what we call real things. Next slide. The Christian story is actually the story of myth becoming fact. As Lewis writes in an essay in God and the Doc, the heart of Christianity is a myth, which is also a fact. The old myth of the dying God without ceasing to be myth, comes down from the heaven of legend and imagination to the earth of history. It happens at a particular place, followed by defining, definable historical consequences. We pass from a Balder or an Os or, or Osiris dying nobody knows where, or when or where, to a historical person crucified under Pontius Pilate. By becoming fact, this is important, it does not cease to be a myth. That, he says, is the miracle. Myth is perhaps, therefore, the deepest form of story. It is not reducible to one-for-one -one meanings, as an allegory might be. It is multivalent. It contains a, a multiplicity of meanings. It's more than just an acceptance of an abstract propositional truth that it calls for. It is an experiential understanding. I think the goal of myth is so well captured in these lovely sentences from Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, where he writes, hitherto you have experienced truth only with the abstract intellect. I will bring you to where you can taste it like honey and be embraced by it as a bridegroom. Your thirst shall be quenched. Now, all of this consideration of myth leads us to a consideration now of what I think is the third approach that Lewis uses and oftentimes weds with mythology. And that is what I, what I call intuitional apologetics. The intuitional approach connects common or heightened spiritual experiences, such as beauty, for example, with the spiritual realities that underlie our own world. Intuition is a faculty that we have of knowing 
that doesn't rely really on reasoning or on proof. So intu intuitional apologetics is a term that I've invented for understanding how Christian conviction can arise not as a result of intellectual argument or through creating creative imaginative myths and stories, but by shining a light on the meanings already present within, but perhaps hidden from view, in common and heightened human experiences. Experiences such as the experience of love, of being present at birth or at death, or especially the appreciation of beauty. These kind of experiences can open up the heart and mind for consideration of the truths which transcend the experiences themselves. They're deeper, they're richer, they're bigger. Though the, though the phrase is my own, I think that what Lewis was talking about often was, uh, was something like intuitional apologetics. When he writes, for example, next slide, the very essence of our life as conscious, as conscious being all day and every day consists of something which cannot be communicated except by hints, similes, metaphors, and the use of those emotions, which are pointers to it. So what I'd like to do with the remainder of this talk is to use the experience of beauty as an example to show one of the ways that this kind of intuitional approach worked in Lewis's own life. How it opened a door that led him toward the reality of God and how it can, through the power of imagination, do the very same thing for you and for me. For Lewis, <clears throat> a powerful response to beauty, which awakened a feeling of desire and longing, was central to his spiritual journey. As he would write in Mere Christianity, when one of my favorite quotes by Lewis, if we find in ourselves, if I find if we find in ourselves a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Lewis spent a lot of time reflecting on these desires throughout his books and what these desires pointed toward. Such experiences of desire came to Lewis in both the beauty of nature and in the imaginative works of, of great writers and poets. In the preface to Pilgrim's Regress, he enumerated some of the ways that what he called sweet desire can arise. He, as he says, it's that unnameable something, desire for which pierces us like a rapier at the smell of a bonfire, the sound of wild ducks flying overhead, the title of the well at, world, at the world's end, the open lines of Kublai Khan, the poem by, by Coleridge, or the morning cobwebs in the late summer, or the noise of falling waves. These are all kinds of triggers for that inner awakening that Lewis was pointing toward. And in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, Lewis writes about how as a child, the mysterious beauty of the faraway Castle Ray Hills, which you see in this photo, uh, which he could see from his nursery window, awakened a longing in his heart. As a child, he didn't really understand what that longing was all about, but he knew he felt it. It created within him a spiritual openness that, that he couldn't shake off, even during the period of his youth when he considered himself to be an atheist. Beauty had cracked open a place that belief would someday enter. And then the second kind of beauty, next slide, uh, that had a profound effect on Lewis was that arising from imagination, the aesthetic experience that he found in books. And one of the first books that had this kind of effect on him was the classic Beatrix Potter book, Squirrel Nutkin, which he credits with introducing to him what he called the idea of autumn. 
This little book introduced him at an early age to an inexplicable pleasure that seemed sourced in a beauty that came from some dimension that he couldn't quite explain or lay his hands on. And then next slide, even more influential was the effect of reading Longfellow stories of Norse mythology as a young man. It wasn't so much the content of the poems he wrote later, but rather <clears throat> the music and the magic of the words, which produced in him this intense desire and a longing within him as he read the words, Balder the beautiful is dead, is dead. Well, Lewis didn't even know who Balder was, nor did he really understand the source of the feelings that he felt when he heard those words or when he read those words. But they were inescapably urgent within him. In Surprise by Joy, he writes of this experience. He said, instantly I was uplifted into huge regions of northern sky. I desired with almost sickening intensity something never to be described. Some years later, the story of Siegfried and that mythology had a similar effect on Lewis, and he found himself once again desirous of that experience, desirous of a repeat, in fact, of that original experience that he had had. And next, and then there was his profound experience upon reading that mystical fantasy novel by George MacDonald called Fantasties. He found a copy in a bookstall in the train station while waiting for an overdue train. And what he found is that his soul was overdue for just such a reading experience. He later said that, that reading this book, he, quote, baptized his imagination. It literally began to reorient the way he understood his life, and it opened him to spiritual possibilities as he glimpsed a world of beauty, holiness, mystery, and innocence within the pages of, of this fantasy novel. Now, I think it's interesting and something worth pondering that this first really significant step in Lewis's journey toward faith was not initiated by reading a book of theological arguments nor a collection of inspiring devotional thoughts, or even a personal testimony of faith, but by this strange and mysterious spiritual fantasy book that further awakened something inside him and caused him to begin to look at the world in a new way. And when his conversion finally came about, it was, it was even in the context of a discussion about mythology, a discussion that took place during an evening ramble along a wooded pathway near his rooms in Oxford um, called Addison's Walk. The mature Lewis would write books of apologetics and theological reflection, but he always embraced the power of beauty, imagination, and story as being highly effective tools for pointing toward the faith. Most Lewis fans, I think, can point to moments in his fictional writing that had that same effect on them that Fantasties had on Lewis himself. An awakening, a response to a spiritual call. And once you have partaken, for example, of the Chronicles of Narnia, the world outside the wardrobe begins to take on the transforming glow of that deeper magic. Now let's take a look then for a moment at the at beauty as a pathway to faith. The experience of beauty points toward a different way of seeing. That's why it's so effective in, in pointing us toward faith. It's perhaps the first step in preparing ourselves to really hear the gospel. I think sometimes we're so busy trying to make the case for Christianity that we fail to see the power in letting our experience of beauty and imagination point the way towards something profound. There's always a place 
always a place for traditional apologetics and intellectual arguments for faith. I'm not saying there isn't. But I wonder if we're often ignoring a simpler and more effective way of pointing others toward truth, a way that is potentially more resonant with the skeptical, cynical, postmodern mind which we come face to face with in our own day. Next slide. Blaise Pascal, one of the greatest apologetics writers of all time, wrote this about the task of apologetics. He said that the purpose of apologetics is to, quote, to make faith attractive, make good men wish it were true, and show that it is. This seems to me to be a very helpful methodology to consider as an alternative way of persuading people of the truth of Christianity. We give them a glimpse of the magnificence and wonder of our way of seeing the world. And then we bring to bear whatever arguments and explanations might be needed to overcome their remaining objections. Because really, for most people, the issue really isn't about evaluating the strength and weaknesses of the various arguments for faith. It honestly doesn't work that way. It isn't like suddenly you're in the middle of an argument about faith and then boom, you, the light comes on and you realize now you have to accept Jesus because it's your only reasonable option. You've been trapped by logic. Well, maybe that works in some people's lives, but honestly, how many people, if you ask them how they become a Christian, would give the answer that, well, it's because I lost an argument. Instead, through pointing toward the beauty, uh, the experience of beauty in nature and in imagination, as a, this is an alternative way. We can open people to a bigger perspective, a more poetic embodiment of the truth, just as Lewis does in so much of his writing. In my own life, it has often been experiences of beauty and imagination that have affirmed for me the existence of a presence of divine grace within the world. Next slide. Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote that the world is charged with the grandeur of God. All around us are beauties large and small which speak of God's glory. Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote, playing off the story of Moses and the burning bush, that earth crammed with heaven and every common bush alive, a fire with God. Therefore, the prophet Isaiah instructs us in Isaiah 40, 26, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each one of them by name. Or from the psalmist in Psalm 19, the first two verses, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they revealed knowledge. Notice that the testimony of the heavens, this testimony that they give about God, communicates so clearly that the psalmist actually refers to it as a form of speech. I mean, there are glimpses of God's glory all around us, inklings of his presence in the world. God's fingerprints are all over his creation. As John Calvin wrote in the Institutes, wherever you cast your eyes, there is no spot in the universe where you cannot discern at least some sparks of glory. In our culture, many people tend to think of the universe as like a giant machine and that nature is merely something we can e exploit for our purposes. But the artist and the Christian are both trying to get people to see that there's something more than that going on, that the universe is more like a grand opera than a book of equations. Next slide. So what can we learn from Lewis's example about responding to beauty and imagination? Well, here are three suggestions for how we might respond. First, we can celebrate and create art that provides a glimpse of divine beauty and a vicarious experience of what faith feels like from the inside. 
By so doing, we can help people feel their way into faith through helping them see the world from a perspective they might never have considered before. Art can effectively sneak past all the objections people might have and prepare them for a moment of revelation. Now, this won't happen if our art is simply propaganda produced to make an argument for truth. Then this is the sad state of so much Christian art, and definitely not the case with C.S. Lewis's art. We must be honest about our shared humanity, and we must tell the truth, even the sometimes uncomfortable truth. Our goal should not be just to inspire, but to cause people to engage in a little wrestling, just like Jacob wrestling with the angel. Our goal should be to create, I think, a habitable space for belief and help people feel their way into that space. We can provide a glimpse of what the world looks like from inside the Christian worldview rather than merely offering an alternative intellectual posture to them. When we get people thinking deeply and wrestling with reality, reality will begin to disclose its deepest meanings. Ultimately, at its most effective, I think art is not so much about providing answers as it is about provoking the right kinds of questions. Great art helps us ask better questions, the kind of questions that actually can bring us to the place of understanding our need for God. Maybe our goal isn't so much to outreason the unbeliever as it is to outnarrate them, to tell a bigger and better and more beautiful story about the meaning of existence. And then we can celebrate and create art that opens up a window to a new and more grace-filled way of thinking. Um, in his book, The Three Ways of Writing for Children, C.S. Lewis imagines a boy who's reading a fairy tale. We'll look at that on this next slide. Uh, fairyland arouses a longing for he knows not what. It stirs and troubles him to his lifelong enrichment. With the dim sense of something beyond his reach and far from dulling or emptying the actual world, gives it a new dimension of depth. He does not despise real woods because he is a red of enchanted woods. The reading makes all real worlds a little more enchanted. Hmm. Lewis does this so beautifully in his fiction, as do so many of the best Christian writers. One of my favorite contemporary Christian novels is Marianne Robinson. And in the pages of her novels, you see the world as a world transfigured by the glory of God. While at the same time, her characters still struggle mightily with their disappointments and sins. But as you inhabit the world through the eyes of John Ames, the pastor who is at the center of her award-winning novel, Gilead, you get insights like this. It has seemed to me that sometimes as though the Lord breathes on this poor gray ember of, self, of creation and turns it to a radiance for a moment or a year, with the span of a life. Perhaps it is such revelatory moments that cause a response like that of Mark O'Connell in his New Yorker review of her book. He wrote, quote, she makes an atheist reader like myself capable of identifying with the sense of a fallen world that's filled with pain and sadness, but also suffused with divine grace. Wow, wouldn't we like our art to do that? Then third, <clears throat> we can learn to look for the holy in the ordinary. George MacDonald believed that some truths cannot be seen until the heart is awakened. And he believed that the eyes of the heart are primarily opened by beauty and imagination. For God can be found everywhere in ordinary life, in every nook and cranny of existence. The holy doesn't only exist in sacred spaces or sacred ideas or in sacred art. In fact, John Calvin famously locked the doors of the church in Geneva during the weekdays because he didn't want his parishioners thinking that they needed a special place to pray and connect with God. They could connect with God anywhere and everywhere. Holiness 
sit squarely within the context and content of the created world. It is a transforming presence hidden except for those with eyes to see. Through an experience of beauty, we can attune our hearts to that presence. And we can help others learn to listen to the knocking of that divine presence at the heart, at the door of their hearts. I love this quote from Marilyn Robinson when she's explaining her own path to faith. She says, I felt God as a presence before I had a name for him. And long before I knew words like faith or belief. Like Lewis, her imagination was baptized before she took that step into belief. So let's open our hearts to receive what beauty might be saying to us. Let's embrace it as a sign of God's extravagant grace. Let's attune ourselves to the quiet and often ignored voice that is speaking in our experience of beauty. Let's open our hearts to the only one who can fill the longing within us. I'd like to close with one of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes from his magnificent sermon, The Weight of Glory. I, I think it brings all the themes we've been exploring into a wonderful synthesis. He writes, God has given us the morning star already. You can go out and enjoy the gift on many fine mornings if you get up early enough. What is more, uh, something the books on aesthetics take little note of, no, notice of. But the poets and the mythologies know all about it. We do not want to merely see beauty, though God knows even that is bounty enough. We want something else that can hardly be put into words. To be united with the beauty we see. To pass into it. To receive it into ourselves. To bathe in it. To become part of it. For if we take the image of scripture seriously, we believe that God will one day give us the morning star and cause us to put on the splendor of the sun. And then we may surmise that the ancient myths and modern poetry, so false as history, may be very near the truth as prophecy. At present, we are on the outside of the world, the wrong side of the door but all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor that will not always be so. Someday, God willing, we shall get in. Imagination and beauty give us a glimpse of God's glory, which can be perceived in the world around us. That world is a testimony to the sacred holiness of what he has created. Imagine, intuition, imagination, intuition, and beauty give us eyes to see. And then on this final slide, if you're interested in exploring any of the, some of these ideas further, they, they inform uh, all three uh, of these uh, uh, books that I've written. So thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, allowing me to share with you some of my excitement about the way that beauty and imagination um, are such a gift that Lewis points us toward. Thank you. Well, thank you, Terry. I'm leaving that slide up just for a few more seconds for folks to screenshot it or write things down because I think they're going to very much relate to some of the questions we have for you as to where to go um, for <laughs> ideas and instruction on these things. And it sounds like you've already laid some of the foundation for us on this. Um, we'll get started with questions and I'll ask a few first. Uh, we don't have a whole lot queued up, but I'm sure they're going to come once we get dialogues going just right on the platforms, folks. Just Type in a question if you have one for uh, for Terry, and we'll we'll dive in. But for now, you know, you said something um, that really struck me in regards to art. I loved what you mentioned about how it's not necessary, and I may butcher exactly what you said, so correct me. But it's not so much about providing answers, but it's more about provoking questions. And I wonder if I mean you could say a little bit more about that, but also I'm. We, we, we can go back to the tried and true, uh, faithful C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, and, you know, the folks that we come back to. But I'm so glad you brought up Robinson. Um, and I'm sure there are others, and you may cover some of this in your books. But today, where is this kind of stuff being produced? Because you mentioned sort of the, the cheesy copycat versions of Christian art uh, that we see and um, good intentions, in trying to create something, but the church used to be the center of the arts. 
And I have come across a few places um, in my time. I, I was in the military in my prior career, so I moved around a lot. And I was struck by one of the churches I was a member at in the latter end of my career, where they really embraced the arts and had art festivals and things like that. And I didn't know what I was missing until I saw that. So maybe you could say a little bit more about that, that statement, as well as give maybe some examples of where this kind of art is being done, both film, music, as well as books. Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I, I do believe that the weakness of a lot of our Christian art we're creating is that it drives, it, it has a confrontational approach, right? It's, it's like, I'm putting the truth out there. You either accept it or reject it. But there it is. I've done my response. I've, my responsibility is taken care of. I'm absolved now because I've put the message out there. And, uh, and, and truly, there, may, there are maybe moments where an absolutely straightforward approach is necessary. But I think not only in art, but even in evangelism, sometimes we need to be thinking about an approach that is less in your face, that is more about grappling with the right kinds of questions. And if we can get people thinking about the kind of questions that they're probably not actually thinking about but should, that can be a transformative uh, thing within their lives. Um, the um, kind of one answer to the second is, I sort of wrote a whole book about that, Discovering God Through the Arts is sort of about the whole fact that the arts can become a tool that we can use for our spiritual growth. And uh, there, there are just many, many ways in which it helps us to read the scriptures uh, with more deeply and with more understanding, how it can help us in our prayer and contemplation, how it can help heal us of some of the pain in our lives, um, how uh, it can help us to become more empathetic and uh, build a deeper compassion for other people. All these and many more things the arts do. And in the back of that book, I actually have a, a several lists of, of novels, of poetry, of films, of music, of all different genres that I think are helpful for getting us into this conversation about these really important spiritual questions. And, uh, you know, and, and these are the questions that have been being asked for uh, throughout Christian history. My 75 Masterpieces book is just, these are just some examples, and I could have easily given 75 or 750 uh, examples of great art that comes out of, of an expression of faith. And even today, uh, I'll just you know we'll, we'll throw in one more thought is is a, something like the chosen, the TV show the chosen. I think is a great example of trying to tell the story more artfully, and uh, and and it 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 works because it makes the stories we think we already know kind of new and unexpected, and uh, that's what art should do. I love it. I love it. Um, well, we've got a comment here by Cynthia. It's not so much a question, but I'm sure it's going to give you something you could, you know, speak to. Uh, Cynthia says Beethoven is to me an affirmation of God's presence. What a gift music at that level of grandeur is. There's no practical reason for anything that wonderful. I mean, I think you could cultivate, or this might be an example of the apologetics you're talking about. It, it is exactly. Um, in fact, uh, um, William F. Buckley once said that uh, that Johann Sebastian Bach was the strongest evidence for the existence of God. <laughs> and I think that's what you're saying, Cynthia, about Beethoven, that there's just something beyond human that gr that great art that shines through the greatest art. And even though Beethoven was maybe not a person of strong faith himself, God's, God's beauty, God's reality, God's, God's communication comes through. He's, he becomes a vessel. 
So thanks for that comment. I think that's a beautiful comment. Yeah. Ginny has um, a straightforward question. She'd like to know how you were introduced to C.S. Lewis and um, where were you first hooked? <laughs> okay. Oh, that's a great question. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ginny. Uh, so um, while I was in Bible college, that was where I had probably my first really major crisis of faith. I began to ask a lot of questions about life and meaning. And frankly, my classes and a lot of people in my church, my pastor, were not actually answering my questions. They were just kind of telling me, just believe, just believe, you know. And um, I, I wasn't a person who, for whom that quite did the trick. So interestingly enough, my first, uh, uh, my first Lewis book was Mere Christianity. Somebody said, you should try that book. And that really helped me a lot. And then my second Lewis book was fiction, was um, The Great Divorce, which I literally read in one sitting. I was so caught up in this powerful story and this powerful vision. So early on, I got both sides of Lewis um, touching my life in powerful ways. That's great. Okay, here's one. Um on sort of the absence of beauty. What about those occurrences that suck beauty out of the spirituality of God's creation? No malice intended in my heart, or no malice intended, but my heart is curious as I seek an answer to explain the state of the world. Uh, you could probably say that, say a lot about the state of art and where it has come today. I think of yeah. Roger Scruton and his write, writings on beauty and things like that. Yeah, um, and uh, as Malcolm Muggeridge uh, very memorably said, some modern art is just buffoonery. Uh, but I will say some modern art actually is quite beautiful and powerful. I think of Mako Fujimura's abstract art, which is really about creating a presence of God. But, uh, and I, I think uh, th that part of the challenge for us is, is to keep in mind there is always ugliness in the world. There's always been ugliness in the world. And actually some of the greatest art and most powerful spiritual writings have come. Uh, I, was reading, I was reading today Julian of Norwich, um, uh, a medieval writer who wrote a beautiful book called The Revelation of, of Divine Love. And she wrote it at a time in which uh, the Black Plague was was going all through uh, England. And so I think her what that made me think about is the fact that we have to be open to searching out beauty in the midst of the ugliness. And there is some art. We need to use our discernment with art because there is some art that is negative and nihilistic and its message is um, is ugly, and it will not uh, feed our soul. So, so we all, there always needs to be the balance. I'm I'm focusing more on the beautiful side tonight, but uh, I think that was a very good observation. Yeah, and I think um, given your background in spiritual formation, which is something I'm very interested in too, it's important to recognize that formation is happening no matter what, and Art is, to use Lewis's um, statement, you know, flying past watchful dragons, art is a key means of being formed. And so I think it's not a matter of if you're being formed, it's a matter of what is forming you. And so what you're talking about with the types of art, maybe you could say something about that. It's a, Yes, it's about choosing that which is going to form you in the most powerful and beautiful ways. Um, in fact, that... If I was to describe the book uh, Discovering God Through the Arts, my whole point in that book is that art is actually a tool for spiritual formation. All the mm -hmm. arts are. They're tools that we can use for spiritual formation. Uh, and so it becomes a matter of paying attention to the best that's available um, and being aware that if we feed ourselves with art that is ugly and nihilistic, um, 
uh, that will create that within ourselves. However, I also want to balance that by saying that we don't always, that art doesn't have to always have a positive message to be valid Christian art. It doesn't always have to tell the whole story. Sometimes even just helping us to see for the first time, like a, like a film like Unforgiven, for example, does, mm. the darkness and brokenness of humanity, that's a first step into the gospel, is really understanding our own brokenness and sinfulness. And so, you know, we, I think it's important that we don't always think all Christian art does not have to be art of worship, though some of it is. It doesn't all have to be art of proclamation, though some of it is. Some of it can be just art about telling the truth about the human condition, because that's part of pointing to people toward the bigger picture of God's truth. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think it's a great uh, just apologetic rule in general. Sometimes we're not going to be able to give the whole you know, depth and width and breadth of the message. We may just ask questions to provoke a response or to give somebody something to sit with. And I can think of a number of idea, you know, uh, films or TV shows that can really um, slowly sink in, you know, to press upon the human condition, the state of the world, my need for, you know, all, you know, to invoke the need for desire. So I think sometimes, and I think you did a good job um, saying that there's always a place for the, the typical, wrote sort of intellectual uh, syllogistic version of apologetics. We'll never not need that. No, we but, do need it. Yes. Yeah, we definitely need that. that undergirds a lot of this. But I, I, mm-hmm. um, I, I've come to see the need for displaying the beauty and the goodness of the message so people can come to realize its truth. And I think for so long, we've done it the other way around. We've argued for the truth in order for them to see the goodness and the beauty. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I think um, as I said, the talk in, in a particularly in our postmodern world, a world where story and narrative actually reaches people at a different level than argumentation does, it becomes it becomes important sometimes that before we can make the argument, we may have to give the narrative, we may have to tell the story, we may have to out narrate our uh our fallen brothers and sisters um, before we can, uh, before we can present uh, the fullness of, of the gospel. I love that. Somebody had a question up a moment ago, I think um, that we didn't get to. We've got a couple that are popping in now. Um, I think, you know, this one, Avery. (laughs) She knows your books pretty well. She's asking how should Christians approach apologetics through beauty and truth in art? when at times society's appetites have been so altered that it no longer sees values in those classic art forms? Good question, Avery. Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. And that's such a hard question to answer. And, you know, um, I, I think one of the things we need to do is hold up the value of, of, of the beautiful traditional art forms. Um, hey, hip hop can present the gospel in a beautiful way, but let's not forget classical music. Let's not forget the beautiful, wonderful tradition of jazz. Let's not forget uh, classical country music and its powerful uh, way of speaking about the human condition. Um, So, you know, I, I think, I think we need to help people to understand that art is for everybody. I recently was speaking to a group of people and part of what I did is I did a little talk about a particular piece of art and this guy, big old guy came up to me um, after I was done. And he said, you know, kind of looked at me and said, well, I don't really much like art, never have. And I said, okay. And he says, but listen to you talk about it. I might could get interested. (laughs) Well, I'm hoping, I, I'm hoping that I opened up a window. I, we have this tendency uh-huh. to treat, especially art like classical music and ballet and opera as kind of so elitist that um, we're, we're putting up walls for people to approach it. 
And one of the things I want to do in my life is introduce people to great art and help it become accessible to them because art is for everybody. And it, you don't, it doesn't have to be snooty art to be great art, you know? And you don't need to be a connoisseur and understand all of the various movements in a piece or understand the deep levels of improv jazz to get it all. You can just enjoy it for enjoyment's sake. Right, exactly. Now, the more you learn about it, if you decide you want to, the more, I mean, when I first heard jazz, I thought, I don't get what's going on. It sounds like everybody's playing something different at the same time. I don't get that. And um, I didn't get jazz, but I stuck with it. And now jazz is one of my favorite musical forms. I love Miles Davis and John Coltrane and a lot of the classical jazz. So there's that balance. There's the balance of you don't necessarily need to be taught but if you're willing to be taught, you might even enjoy more of something. And so it's a lifelong, yeah. I, I find it's a lifelong, uh, 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 wonderful journey. Okay. Well, we've got time for probably these last three questions. And I think this one you could spend a while on. But uh, Denise asks, they say beauty's in the eye of the beholder. I can see this is a classic question. Uh, and I can hear pushback on that when attempting to classify classics as a means to discover truth. What say you? Well, that is one we could spend way too much time on, and that yeah. might be a good talk for one time. But let me just say this about that, that um, I, I don't think beauty is only in the eye of the beholder. I, yeah. I reject that concept. Um, that's one of those truisms that I don't think is true, that there is actual beauty out there, and that beauty sometimes does demand some work to appreciate i mean you think about it you an artist a novelist takes maybe a year to write a novel that we read in a short time or or even a, a think about a painting where you might spend months creating a painting and how can we expect that if we look at it quickly give it a glance that that's all we need to do right that we should at least pay the respect of giving a little time with art before we decide to accept it or reject it. I love it. I've always thought what God calls beautiful is beautiful, whether I think so or not. Um, so, okay. Uh, Carissa asks, what do you think is the role of apologetics and art for Gen Z who is naturally more spiritual, but also relativizes truth? Mm. Wow. Once again, I mean, I'd love to, I'd love to have a conversation with you, Carissa, about that. You could, probably um you could probably teach me a lot about that it's something i've really thought a lot about um i have such a heart for i have such a heart for young creatives who want to find ways to exercise their creativity in a way that is meaningful to people and you know in, there's a certain sense in which we have to accept where people are at and then we have to put the energy in to take them to a different place. And we have to help. They may relativize truth, but over time, I think the arts are one of the ways we can help them realize that there actually is, um, there actually is such a thing as, as truth and that it's meaningful. I don't think I gave a very good answer to that question, but... Well, it's hard to answer those in very short times. I think you're right. This could be uh, another talk. And I, I think Carissa and some of her colleagues would be a great job of helping us understand that with a couple of older guys and understanding yeah. Gen Z. Uh, my good buddy Jason here asks, why do humans want to be a part of beauty when we see it? Oh, wow. Well, I'll, I'll just say I don't know the answer to that question, but I know exactly what it is talking about. I remember recently driving by, it was a foggy evening and the fog was kind of sitting low in a field nearby where I was driving. And I couldn't help myself. I just stopped and pulled over to look. And what I wanted to do is I just wanted to wade into that beauty. There is something about, um, there's something about beauty that calls out to us that asks us to participate in it. Um, and I think that is part of the full experience of art 
is when the work of the artist is added to the work that we do as the viewer or the listener or the reader, we come together in that act of creation. That the act of creation is something more than just what the artist does. It's what the listener does. It's what the viewer does as well. Yeah, and I wonder if it's something, um, you mentioned Mako Fujimori, you're making me think of, um, and I'm gonna, I won't even try to say the name, but he's introduced and made, um, brought into the conversation, the art of broken pottery. Are oh, yes. <laughs> Maybe you could explain that better than I, but I found that to be a beautiful metaphor for something God is doing in us to make us beautiful. Yeah, that, and I'm not an expert in, uh, like he is in, in Japanese art, but there is something about taking the the broken pottery and you put it together with gold, you know, you, you use gold to put it back together and then you've created something new out of the brokenness, which is exactly what God does with our lives. And really all, any art we offer to God is probably broken in various ways by our own sinfulness. And yet it still can reach people, which to me, that's a, that's a very powerful message. It says, when I want to share Jesus' love with somebody, I don't have to be perfect. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you have any closing comments for us? I've just kind of put up uh, the words from your slide on the intuitional approach for folks, but uh, any parting comments or encouragements or admonitions for us as we try to live this out in our own day-to-day -day, uh, discipleship? Um, I don't know what specifically I could add other than just saying this is a journey that I'm on. It's a journey of learning. Um, I'm experiencing. Um, and, uh, you know, I would just uh, invite people to uh, join me in this process. And I'd love to hear from others about uh, what they've experienced. If you want to write me, uh, you can write me through my, you can contact me through my website. Uh, terryglassby.com and uh, happy to happy to interact a little bit. Great. And we actually have an opportunity for everybody uh, coming up next week. We're doing an event with Russ Ramsey, discovering beauty, goodness, and truth. Uh, believe it or not, this wasn't planned. We did. We invited Terry to come speak tonight and um, our colleagues in Washington, DC planned this one. And Russ is the author of Rembrandt in the Wind. You're probably familiar with that one, Terry. Yeah, it's a wonderful book. I, uh, I, I look. I, I might have to tune in to watch this myself. I think I could learn a lot from Russ. So, Russ is wonderful. Uh, he's been a guest on our podcast, Questions That Matter, and this is a content uh, continuation of that discussion. And he just does a great job diving into some of the classic art. So some of the questions we had based on that. Um, makes classic art a little more accessible for those of us who don't know the difference between a Rembrandt and a, you know, name another one that's not coming to mind because I'm on the spot, but the different artists, sometimes I'm not sure who's who. So mm -hmm. this is going to be great for someone like me. And I'm sure those of you who are tuned in are probably like me, unless uh, you're like Terry and you've written a couple of books on this. So um, thanks for joining us tonight, Terry. We've been excited to excited to have you tonight first time and definitely not going to be the last time we are looking forward to doing more with you in the future so um, keep writing and we're excited let me just give another plug uh, for his most recent book not a tame lion through moody publishers and we're excited to um, have you as part of our extended community terry it's great to share with you today so thank okay. you everybody have a great night and uh Join us next week for Russ Ramsey and keep an eye out on our email lists and social media. We will have more events like this soon. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>